This is CBC Winnipeg News. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. A dramatic crash between two trucks last night in East St. Paul has sent five people to hospital. RCMP say they have serious but non-life-threatening injuries. Witnesses told police the vehicles may have been racing or chasing one another. CBC's Gavin Axelrod has more. In a quiet neighborhood just north of Winnipeg, a high-speed crash between two trucks has people living here wondering what happened. And then you can see the big divot there. Stacy Corden's two kids were in the backyard doing spring cleaning and saw the crash. I heard this huge screech and crash, and then I was coming out of the trailer, and they came running around the corner. Oh, my God, there's an accident. Corden says she ran over to the accident in flip-flops. The two trucks were crumpled and debris everywhere. And it was horrific. I thought instantly, like, there's no way anybody survived this. It was a pit in my stomach. RCMP say the 29-year-old driver of one truck and three men and a woman in the other one were taken to hospital with serious but non-life-threatening injuries. Corden says she can't believe it wasn't worse. We go on that path almost every day. Uh, I go for walks or we go for family bike rides or we take the kids. Like, we could have been on that path. Anybody could have been on that path. It's, it's a very quiet neighborhood. You know, we don't like driving fast around here. It's, it's, it's very scary as a parent, for sure. Video of the crash shows the two trucks colliding, then rolling multiple times. RCMP don't know yet what led to the crash, but say they are aware of some sort of interaction beforehand. They're asking witnesses to come forward with information. No arrests have been made. Gavin Axelrod, CBC News, East St. Paul. The city is looking at ways to clean up homeless camps around Winnipeg, but it come, could come with a hefty multi-million dollar price tag. Organizations who work on the front line say there's a better way to do it. CBC's Brittany Greenslade has more. They're a common sight along Winnipeg's riverbanks. Encampments that are full of garbage and debris and pose significant safety concerns. Encampments can be dangerous. They can be frankly unsightly. Uh, and, and for people that live in proximity to an encampment, there are concerns. It's been an ongoing issue in Winnipeg, and the city says it needs to be cleaned up. I've taken tours with residents, uh, for example, in the waterfront drive area of encampments, and, and we've been working in the past. We'll continue to work together to get encampments cleaned up. But it could come at a big cost, according to a new report. It says there are currently around 150 homeless camps spread out across the city. Cleanups last year cost taxpayers nearly $84,000. That was for 162 cleanups at $517 each. The report pegs weekly cleanups at all camps at $4 million a year. That's overkill. It's, it's way beyond what, what folks are calling for. Main Street Project says major weekly cleanups are not needed. Kate Schoberg says those who live in these encampments want to keep them clean, but don't have the access to be able to. That's what people experiencing homelessness have been saying. I want to keep my home clean and tidy. But if there isn't a service available to remove the, the waste that, I don't, that I'm not using anymore, then, then what, what am I supposed to do? She says a better solution could be much simpler and cheaper, roughly $250,000 instead of millions. Providing roll bins to people living in encampments where, you know, on a weekly basis, just like in a household or an apartment, you're gathering your items, you're putting in your roll bin for someone to take away. That is not the same cost as a major cleanup. But Schulberg says she's happy the issue is being looked at and says it's a step in the right direction. The report goes to the Executive Policy Committee next week. Brittany Greenslade, CBC News, Winnipeg. The owners of the Winnipeg Jets include one of the wealthiest people in Canada, and now they say they want to help some of the most vulnerable people in Winnipeg. CBC's Bartley Kivas reports on what David Thompson and Mark Chipman have in mind to reduce homelessness in Manitoba's capital. Gabriel Velarde looking for his first career hat trick, and here it is. He scores. The Winnipeg Jets are playoff bound this season, but outside Canada Life Centre, there aren't many success stories. Signs of homelessness and addictions have become more prominent since the pandemic started. Two years ago, Jets co-owner Mark Chipman described it like this. It's gone long past just being heartbreaking. 
It's become, uh, in my humble opinion, a humanitarian crisis. Hey man, how's it going? Mark Chipman responded to that crisis by funding downtown street patrols. He helped open this homeless shelter in South Point Douglas and is taking on a massive downtown revitalization project. True North Real Estate Development is close to exercising its option on a $650 million purchase and renovation of Portage Place. The plans include affordable housing and a medical tower. I sure don't think we'd be exercising the option in June. If I didn't see and feel a real commitment from our public sector partners to once and for all engage the root causes of, uh, of the crisis we're in right now. Chipman is not stopping with Portage Place. He and Jets co-owner David Thompson, one of Canada's most affluent people, are thinking about doing more. What we lack desperately in the city right now is the ability to transition people out of that type of living arrangement into a more independent uh, circumstance, and it just doesn't exist. Thompson and Chipman are now considering providing transitional housing. That is, housing tailored to people with a history of homelessness or addictions who need help finding a home and keeping it. When people talk about, you know, uh, about homelessness, it, it's, a, it's a very complex uh, subject that requires a range of, of different housing options for people to move through, and we're stuck. Um, so we're stuck with a lack of transitionary housing. Thompson and Chipman brought their idea last fall to the mayor and premier. If we can tap into the expertise on acquiring and renovating housing to bring new units online or standing up new housing units to help us meet the needs of addressing homelessness and to respond to the needs around social housing, I think that would be really welcome. What this is, is all about is everybody coming together. It, it takes the public sector and the private sector and the nonprofits to be in partnership to really address our, our issue of homelessness and the need for housing. While it's not unusual for NHL owners to engage in commercial development near their arenas, this economist says Chipman and Thompson's interest in the social welfare of Winnipeg is unusual. It's really hard to come up with another example of an owner who's made such a large commitment to not-for-profit investment to kind of building up the civic space. As a result, it's become hard to separate the success of True North's downtown development efforts from the success of downtown itself. Your business and your work, how do you feel about that being inextricably linked with the health of the community overall now? Well, I mean, it's some days it's a real daunting um, responsibility. Uh, other days it feels somewhat natural in that it's just what we've been doing. I, I don't think we set out to be that or to have that responsibility, but it's, it's, we've kind of fallen in that path. And so, you know, it is what it is. Bert Kivas, CBC News, Winnipeg. A prayer recited at Manitoba's seat of power may be getting a makeover. Premier Wam Kanu says the prayer should be more representative of other faiths. CBC's Ian Fraze explains. A long-running tradition at the Manitoba Legislature. O Eternal and Almighty God, from whom all power and wisdom come, we are since 1937, the, that prayer has barely changed. The but Premier Wab Kanu says it might be time to rethink those words. But I would ask, especially looking around the room here this morning, at the people, the good Manitobans who've come together, whether that prayer is representative and inclusive of all of us here today. Speaking at a breakfast of faith leaders, the Premier said he prays every morning in the Anishinaabe tradition, and he'd like to see the prayer said at the legislature become more inclusive. While it doesn't have any overtly Christian references, Canoe says it still feels like a Christian prayer. It has references to God, archaic English like thy and thee, and ends with amen. I have a deep reverence for Christianity, I would also say that beginning in an institution like the Manitoba Legislature, I wonder what the space is for somebody who is an atheist or somebody who is a believer but perhaps puts the role of secularism in our public sphere first. Canu says Speaker Tom Lindsay suggested the prayer refresh. It can't happen without all party support. The Tories aren't saying where they stand but stress nobody can change the prayer unilaterally. 
The Premier wants the advice of faith leaders and other Manitobans first. I think it's wonderful. It's wonderful that they're, they're taking into consideration different ways to, I guess, uh, uh, make sure everybody feels welcome. Labid Ahmed, an imam in the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, expects that finding consensus will be tough. Prayer at the end of the day, usually traditionally they would, they would acknowledge a deity. And at that point, I feel like that's not agreeable to certain people. St. John's Cathedral Minister Paul Johnson says he doesn't see the possible change as an affront to Christianity, but worries some will. And I think that's sad. I think uh, Jesus himself did not ask people for ID or limit his interaction with people. He was just with them. The Premier insists prayer still has a place in the legislature. He called it an important moment of reflection. Ian Fraze, CBC News, Winnipeg. Manitoba has set a target of adding 100 more doctors to the province's health care system by this time next year. Advocates are calling it ambitious but achievable. CBC's Rosanna Hempel has more. Manitoba added 44 doctors to the health care system last year. The province has a new goal to attract and retain more than double that in the next 12 months. 100 new doctors. This is an ambitious target. This would be the most net new physicians in a year that our province has ever seen. The plan is part of $309 million in this year's budget to recruit, retain and train health care workers. The province says its new recruitment and retention office will help with that, as will improving collaboration and the culture in the health care system. Today, we're offering Manitobans a united front a system-wide commitment from all partners to set ambitious goals and to achieve those goals. Doctors Manitoba is optimistic the plan will work. If we can add 10% more doctors than the average and lose 10% fewer doctors than average, we can hit that 100 number. Doctors Manitoba Chair Candace Bradshaw says the plan is long overdue. For years, the physician shortage has been a top concern. But Bradshaw says already, changes are giving doctors a reason to stay in the province, such as Family Medicine Plus, the new family doctor funding model. We're able to spend more time with our patients now because of our new um, funding model, our new contract. Um, we're able to keep our clinics open. We can um, uh, get compensated for owning and running a clinic. Still, Manitoba is short 445 doctors from the national average of physicians per capita. Advocates hope more supports are also coming for graduates and physicians trained abroad. Rosanna Hempel, CBC News, Winnipeg. The Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra is asking people to destroy a collectible set sold at their music stand because of toxic levels of lead. Health Canada has issued a recall order on the tranquility and teaching sets from the Canadian Art Prince Indigenous Collection. The plates feature artwork by painter William Monague. The WSO says it's accepting recalls on all of the plate sets. It'll remove the product from its inventory and post recall notices at upcoming concerts. The symphony is asking anyone who bought the plates to stop using them immediately. Health Canada says as of late last month, nearly 1,500 of the plates were sold in Canada. An appeal hearing wrapped up today in the lawsuit against the city of Winnipeg over the Parker lands. The city announced the last summer that it would challenge a judge's decision awarding five million dollars to a local developer. CBC's Cameron McLean has the latest. Over the last two days, lawyers for two city planners argued they are not to blame for delays on a major housing development. Developer Andrew Marquess sued the city, alleging officials deliberately stalled his bid to build 1,900 units on land in Fort Garry. Court of King's Bench Justice Shauna McCarthy found two city planners, Michael Robinson and Braden Smith, committed misfeasance in public office. In her decision, she said the planners did this at the direction of the area councillor John Orlico, who was not a defendant in the case. 
McCarthy awarded Marquis $5 million. At the appeal hearing, lawyers for the two planners said the judge misunderstood the facts. They say their clients were doing their jobs and raising legitimate concerns. They also argue their clients didn't have the power to make decisions about the project. That power lies with counsel. And they argued McCarthy didn't explain how she came up with the $5 million figure. Lawyers for Marquis say the planners violated their professional code of conduct and collaborated with Orlico to thwart the project without justification. The appeal court judges reserved their decision. Meanwhile, at City Hall, the city's property committee voted unanimously to approve a new application from Marquis to build on the Parker lands. That proposal now moves on to the city's executive policy committee and then to council as a whole. Cameron McLean, CBC News, Winnipeg. A 20-year-old man is in hospital after being shot while buying a gun. Police were called to the 500 block of Mountain Avenue Monday night. They were looking for a man who had reportedly been shot. He was found several blocks away on McPhillips Avenue with multiple gunshot wounds. Police say the victims arranged to meet the suspect, or the victim rather, arranged to meet the suspects through a website to buy the gun. He told investigators that when they, he became suspicious of their behavior, one of the suspects pulled a gun and fired at his vehicle as he drove away. Police are looking for two men one in his 20s who was wearing a white hoodie and a man in his 30s who was wearing dark clothing and carrying a long gun. A Brandon woman says her faith in the banking industry has been shaken after her bank accounts were emptied in a case of e-transfer fraud. She's now filed a complaint with the National Banking Ombudsman to try to recover the money. CBC's Vera Lynn Kubinek reports. Nicole Roy is a small business owner in Brandon. Last October, she got some distressing news by email that her bank account had gone into overdraft. I never use overdraft, so I was super surprised, quickly opened up the app and was extremely shocked to see that my entire savings, everything, my, my, my account had been cleaned out completely. She learned someone had taken the $3,000 she had in the bank by using a fraudulent e-transfer. She says she has no idea how it happened, but the bank told her she must have given out her personal identification number and her bank card. She says that did not happen. I would never give anyone my PIN number or my card, especially to my business account, and let them clean me out. BMO eventually gave Roy $500 in what was called a gesture of goodwill, but she's still missing the remainder of her money. In March, Roy filed a complaint to the Ombudsman for Banking Services and Investments, but she's not optimistic about the outcome of her complaint. In its 2023 annual report, OBSI data shows only about one quarter of the banking complaints that year resulted in getting any money back. Fraud cases more than quadrupled last year to 950, up from 215 in 2022. OBSI data shows that in the past year, the most common complaint for Manitoba was e-transfer fraud, which accounted for 18 of the 50 cases opened. Sarah Bradley, the ombudsman at OBSI, says she can understand why the numbers may be disappointing. Oh, I can understand people's frustration in that regard. Uh, we review complaints after they have been through the bank's internal uh, complaint handling process. There are, our role is to make sure that, uh, that there's an independent view and that the consumer has been treated fairly and has received uh, fair compensation in their case. Duff Conacher is co-founder of Democracy Watch and an advocate for bank accountability. The banks have essentially set up the system to blame the customer always when money is taken out of someone's account wrongfully and the customer pays and the bank uh, refuses to pay. And the banks have not done enough to protect customers. Nicole Roy says losing her money to fraud has shaken her faith in the banking system. She doesn't accept e-transfers anymore at her business and she tries to avoid online banking as much as possible. Vera Lynn Kubinek, CBC News, Winnipeg. <laughs> Business owners in Riding Mountain National Park are concerned about the impact of a potential watercraft ban on their businesses.
Live zebra mussels were found last fall in Boat Cove in Clear Lake, so Parts Canada is considering keeping boats out of the lake to stop the spread. It's done a number of water tests and says they've come up negative for zebra mussels, but Parks Canada is concerned the invasive species could still be there. Information Radio's Marcy Marcusa spoke with some business owners in the area earlier today. When we first were notified by uh, Parks Canada of the three options, I immediately seen um, tangible impact of, of cancellations. What happens next year? What happens in five years? Um, as we've seen in Lake Winnipeg uh, and other lakes across North America, um, we need a long-term solution. The province is urging Parks Canada not to go ahead with the ban. Ottawa says no decision has been made. Well, our CBC weather specialist Riley Lechuk is here with the forecast. Riley, nice and sunny now, but I actually got caught in a little <laughs> rain shower today. Really changeable weather today. Yeah, lots of change, lots of little hiccups and uh, scattered showers, uh, Emily. We're still seeing some of that moving through. Uh, southern Manitoba looking at satellite and radar right now. Yes, you can see that we still do have a few of these little streamers making their way uh, through southern and uh, south central Manitoba, even back uh, into northwestern Ontario. So not quite done uh, with the wet weather uh, quite yet uh, here in southern Manitoba. And yes, we did get some of those heavier pockets of rain through the later afternoon uh, here in the city of Winnipeg. Yes, nice rain to kind of cut down on, on some of the dust uh, and to kind of, you know, get that lawn watering started as we get into uh, the spring months here. So, yes, we'll, we'll, we'll see some of that as we get through the evening hours tonight. By the time we get to tomorrow morning, back to a sunny sky in Winnipeg. Still a few lingering flurries through uh, parts of northern Manitoba that will taper off as we get through the day on Friday. Then we set up for what will be our next weather maker as we head into the weekend, this is an area of instability moving through Alberta across through Saskatchewan, mainly impacting northern Manitoba as we get through Saturday. But yes, another band of some uh, much needed precipitation coming to southern Manitoba as we get through the early part of Saturday. That wraps up by the time we hit lunchtime or so, and we're kind of left in this sort of mix of sun and clouds tapering flurries uh, and some scattered flurries uh, through the later part of Saturday into Sunday across northern Manitoba. And then we kind of set up for uh, what will be our next weather maker into next week, which could bring us some accumulating precipitation uh, into the middle part of the week. So taking this out to uh, Saturday lunchtime, yes, uh, scattered in nature uh, in terms of rainfall in that two to four millimeter range. So really not a lot of precipitation coming, but yes, enough to kind of, you know, dampen down some of the dust and uh, keep stuff watered. Uh, for the north, uh, by the time we get to early Saturday morning, it looks like a trace amount of some uh, precipitation in the northwest, but the northeast looking at about two to four centimeters of snow. So 11 degrees right now in Winnipeg, pressure is rising. North winds at 20 have been a little bit gusty uh, through the night tonight. We're looking at a partly cloudy zero overnight tonight in Winnipeg. First thing in the morning, uh, plus two, a partly cloudy sky. North winds at 10, and by the time we get to the afternoon we're looking at a 14 degree high in Winnipeg uh, north winds at 10 uh, through the afternoon tomorrow so a lot less breezy tomorrow uh, than it was today as we head into the weekend though we will start to see uh, some of that wind pick up again but warmer temperatures so I mentioned the 14 on Friday 20 degrees on Saturday with that uh, chance of, of uh, some lingering showers. 19 in the city could hit 20 elsewhere in southern Manitoba. 17 uh, on Sunday. Yes, winds gust to 40 for both Saturday and Sunday. And then we see clouds start to build in on Monday and uh, rain begins through the later part of Tuesday, Emily. And that sets up the middle end of next week when we'll see a little bit more precipitation coming our way. Thank you, Riley. You're welcome. Well, with those spring temperatures that Riley mentioned, comes spring cleaning. The city kicks off its annual street cleanup on Sunday. Crews will be out over the next six weeks, sweeping up all that sand and debris from streets and sidewalks. The city reminds people to watch for temporary no parking signs to avoid being ticketed or towed. You can keep tabs on when your street will be clean through the city's website and the Know Your Zone app. Yard waste pickup starts April 20. 9th for residents who are in collection area A and on May 6th for those in area B. 
Well, coming up, putting home ownership within reach for young Canadians. The federal government says it has a plan. We'll have that story after the break. The federal government has unveiled its plan to make home ownership more affordable for more Canadians. The move comes ahead of its next week's budget. It's the latest in a string of announcements that the Liberals seem to be targeting towards young Canadians. CBC's Ashley Burke reports. Another pre-budget announcement aimed at millennials and Gen Z. Many younger Canadians feel that the dream of home ownership is just that, a dream. Our government is changing that. Millennials helped catapult the Liberals into power in 2015. <laughs> now, eight years later, the party's trying to win back their support as they struggle in the polls. Common sense of the common And have been hammered for months by the Conservatives. After eight years of Trudeau, housing costs have doubled. We want home ownership to be a reality for younger Canadians. The government announcing that starting next week, first-time homebuyers can pull out up to $60,000 from their RRSP for a down payment on a home. That's $25,000 more than before. And they won't have to start repaying those contributions for five years. 
For those who don't have a 20% down payment, they will have more time to pay off their mortgages. Effective August 1st of this year, we are allowing 30-year amortizations on insured mortgages for first-time home buyers purchasing newly built homes. That includes new condos and townhouses. The government says it will make monthly mortgage payments more affordable. Developers and builders say it will also spur new construction, which has been slow because people can't afford to buy. We can get more first-time buyers into the market. That enables us to build more homes. It also frees up rental units too. Canada needs 1.3 million new homes by 2030 to get rid of the country's housing gap. That's according to a new report today by the Parliamentary Budget Officer. It will not be a game changer for everybody, but for some it will be another piece of the incremental support they're looking for. This all comes ahead of the budget on Tuesday. The finance minister says that the deficit won't grow, so the question now is how will the government come up with the revenue to pay for its new promises? Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. Conservative leader Pierre Polyav delivered a keynote speech today at a networking conference supporting Canada's conservative movement. It comes as the federal conservatives seek to widen their lead in the polls against the governing liberals. CBC's Olivia Stepanovich has more. Please uh, join me in welcoming uh, the common sense conservative, the next prime minister of Canada, Pierre Polyev. It's a title the opposition leader is hearing more often these days. Merci beaucoup. Who's ready to axe the tax? With his party soaring in the national polls, Conservative leader Pierre Polyev is on a mission to solidify his lead and topple his main political rival. See, the thing is, it's not that Justin Trudeau is too liberal. It's that he's not liberal at all. In a speech before a conservative networking conference, Polyev took shot after shot at the prime minister and got personal. Pierre Elliott Trudeau famously plagiarized when he said that the government had no place in the bedrooms of the nation. Now his son wants the government to be in every room of your house and your business. National polls show Polyev's strategy is paying off. A new survey by Abacus Data shows the Tories 20 points ahead of the Liberals, their biggest lead yet. It's very exciting for Conservatives to finally have that person in place and to charge people who are under 40 and get them going and get them excited. We're on the cusp of a new energy, a new movement in this country. This despite a flurry of pre-budget announcements by the federal government, amounting to tens of billions of dollars in promises. As much as the Liberals are trying to, to, to take control of the agenda, demonstrate to people that they have a plan, um, it doesn't seem to be working to change people's minds. This pollster says Canadians are being drawn to Polyev's messaging on affordability, a focus that he says is bleeding support from all parties. They're picking up significant numbers from former Liberal voters, from former New Democrat voters, from former People's Party of Canada uh, party supporters. With the federal election more than a year away, he says there could be a risk for the Conservatives peaking too early, but only if voters are convinced a change in government would be worse than the status quo. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Ottawa. O.J. Simpson has died at the age of 76. The former NFL superstar was acquitted of double murder in 1995 in a trial that captivated the world. Simpson was one of the greatest running backs in football history, playing mainly for the Buffalo Bills in the 1970s. Simpson's career off the field brought fame and fortune in movies and commercials, but his reputation was in tatters and spiraled following his murder trial. He was accused in a brutal knife attack on his ex-wife Nicole Brown Simpson and her friend Ron Goldman in 1994. But a jury acquitted him in a controversial verdict. The defense team claimed O.J. had been framed by a racist Los Angeles police force. Simpson was later found liable in a civil judgment. More recently, in a different case, Simpson spent nine years behind bars for an armed robbery in Las Vegas in 2007. He was released in 2017. Simpson's family says he died yesterday after a long bout with cancer.
Israel says it's ready to defend itself against Iran and says it would respond directly to any attack. This after Tehran vowed retaliation over last week's deadly airstrike on the Iranian consulate in Syria. The U.S. is, meanwhile, trying to engage other countries to deal with the escalating tensions in the region. Caroline Malone has the latest from Washington. The White House, Pentagon and State Department have all responded to questions of an imminent threat from Iran to strike Israel, insisting it would support its ally if it happened. But at the same time saying it doesn't want to increase regional tension and that its top diplomat, Secretary of State Antony Blinken, is reaching out to counterparts. Secretary Blinken has been engaged in diplomacy over the past 24 hours uh, through a series of calls to foreign counterparts, including Turkish Foreign Minister Hakan Fidan, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi, and Saudi Foreign Minister Faisal bin Farhan to make clear that escalation is not in anyone's interest and that countries should urge Iran not to escalate. We communicated to Iran that the U.S. had no involvement uh, in the strike, as I just mentioned, uh, that happened in Damascus, and we warned Iran not to use uh, this attack as a pretext uh, to escalate further in the region or attack U.S. facilities or pers personnel. Iran says Israel must be punished for an April 1st strike on its embassy compound in Damascus, in which 13 people were killed, including a top Iranian commander who oversaw operations in Lebanon and Syria. Hezbollah and other Iran-backed groups have attacked Israel since the Hamas attack and Israel's Gaza response. While Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has said in no uncertain terms, whoever hurts Israel will be hurt in return. The U.S. priorities are to support Israel's right to defend itself, but also protect its own troops, who risk being increasingly drawn into a regional conflict with threats all around. Caroline Malone for CBC News, Washington. A Vietnamese real estate tycoon has been sentenced to death in the country's biggest ever case of financial fraud. Trung Mi Lan is a high-profile businesswoman who chaired a major property development company. She also secretly controlled the large commercial bank she was convicted of defrauding. Trung was arrested in 2022 and charged with fraud amounting to over $17 billion Canadian. Prosecutors say total damages from the scam are over $37 billion. That's equivalent to 6% of Vietnam's GDP last year. Death sentences are not uncommon in there, but it is rare in financial crime cases and for someone this well known. Millions of Haitians have been struggling to find food since February amid worsening gang violence. <laughs> A new report says nearly 5 million people in the country are facing acute food insecurity, which of course means 1.5 million are dealing with emergency levels of hunger. The UN World Food Program says violence, inflation and poor harvests have all contributed to the situation. WFP officials say they've been providing food assistance in Haiti since the start of the latest crisis. About half a million hot meals have been distributed among the displaced population so far. Well, snowpack levels in British Columbia are the lowest they've been since 1970. We'll find out what that means for this summer and the upcoming wildfire season after the break.
A thick winter snowpack can help reduce summer wildfires, but across much of British Columbia this year, that didn't happen. CBC's Michelle Morton has the story. As of April 1st, the provincial snowpack is at 63% of normal, 25% lower than last year, and the lowest since records began in 1970. Without that snowpack, we're going to be dependent on periodic rain throughout the summer to both saturate the ground and to keep our forests um, both vitalized and to keep snow or to keep the fire danger low, but also to maintain this flow in the, the streams and the rivers. The report finds only Vancouver Island saw a normal amount of precipitation. Daniels warns the El Nino winter kicked off in early spring, setting us up for a long, dry wildfire season. And we know that we're in a multi-year drought, so these are places already that had low precipitation last summer. We had big fires as a result last summer, and um, we went right through the fall with low rainfall, not enough snow through the winter. The report comes just as Metro Vancouver announces its seasonal watering restrictions. Starting May 1st, residents and businesses can only water lawns once a week. The River Forecast Centre says the snowpack could increase into May with more cold, wet weather, and it notes the low snowpack could have one benefit. The lower risk for flooding this year in the interior. Uh, areas that have been hard hit by flooding, I'm thinking about Cache Creek or Grand Forks, uh, they can, I hopefully will breathe a sigh of relief that the likelihood of flooding this year is pretty low. But he warns, sudden or extreme rain could still cause flooding. Michelle Morton, CBC News, Vancouver. CBC Weather Specialist Riley Laychuk is back. Riley, we just heard about the thinner snowpack in mm -hmm. BC this year. Was that also the case in Manitoba? Y yeah, we'll, we'll kind of look at the numbers, but yes, we did have a, a drier winter than normal across much of the province. Here's what's left of that snowpack in southern Manitoba, at least. Yes, not a lot. Uh, a couple pockets here and there through the Turtle Mountains and uh, through the Riding Mountains into the northern Interlake. But yes, a lot more snow still to the north, even along the Hudson Bay coast. Uh, quite a bit of snow still on the ground. And yes, this, this bare ground extends right through Saskatchewan and southern Alberta as well. So yes, your dog walking forecast, we couldn't let the cats have more than one day for now. But uh, we have Bowie, who uh, it looks like is enjoying uh, what's left of the snow. Thank you so much uh, to uh, Amanda for sending that in. And I want your pictures. I'd love to add them to my collection. Talk back at cbc.ca is where you can email those too. Nice morning for a dog walk tomorrow, plus two. First thing in Winnipeg, up to 14. Mainly sunny skies for the afternoon. And yes, not as windy uh, as it was today. Uh, take the dog out for a walk. And uh, yeah, we did see some pretty strong gusts. So peak wind gusts of the afternoon today, about uh, 40, even over 50 through the Red River Valley. A bit lighter back to the west and to the north. So yes, we did feel those winds in the Red River Valley and they will die down as we get into the day tomorrow. Uh, temperatures, here's where we got to today. Uh, up to 12 in Winnipeg. I was shooting for that 13, but the, those on and off showers that really pushed through really dropped the temperature down. In some cases, even 5 degrees hour by hour through the afternoon today. Up to 8 today in Roblin, 7 uh, in the Paw. As for our forecast, tonight some patchy cloud cover uh, through southern Manitoba. Chance of some lingering showers through the West Man region, minus ones uh, for Dauphin and Roblin, minus three uh, in Clear Lake, uh, zero overnight tonight in Winnipeg. And really looking at temperatures around freezing uh, across southern Manitoba, much the same for the north as well. We do have a chance of some scattered flurries across north central Manitoba, still in lows getting around to about minus two, minus four degrees. So yes, we will see that shower and that flurry activity taper off by the time we hit lunch tomorrow, but still some pretty cloudy conditions across much of northern Manitoba peaks of sunshine through the later afternoon and in the south we are looking at a sunnier sky and yes much less wind by the time we get to late afternoon at about 11 12 degrees through west man mainly cloudy skies so the further west you go tomorrow and more sunnier conditions up to 14 in Winnipeg eights for northwestern Ontario your seven day forecast Emily is just ahead thanks Riley You're welcome Provincial campground bookings opened up this week, but with so many choices, which campsite should you pick? We'll talk to a Winnipeg couple who knows the ropes when it comes to staking out a site after the break.
Reservations started this week for camping in provincial parks. The booking system opens up gradually with different campgrounds becoming available each day to avoid bottlenecks as people go online. Our next guests have lots of experience choosing their campsites. Lorraine and Wade Kaler are a retired couple from Winnipeg who love camping. They have a YouTube channel highlighting their outdoor adventures called On the Off Ramp. Hi, Lorraine and Wade. Hi there. Hi, I'm Wade. Hi, so you guys have visited so many Manitoba campgrounds. Which ones are your favorites? Oh, it depends what you want to do with the campground, but you know, maybe one of our heart favorites because we've always had the great weather in the view is Otter Falls Campground, a little one in the white shell. Mm. How Falls. about you, Wade? What do you think? Um, I think the big white shell mm, is yes. one of my favorites. It's kind mm. of a little bit more remote, so that part is nice. So a little quieter, I guess. Yeah, yeah, Tulabee Falls is another, yeah, there's so it's, many. It's hard for us, really, yeah. <laughs> but that's a hard question. <laughs> it is such a beautiful province, and it's interesting because a lot of people find camping a bit overwhelming. You know, there's all that prep work, packing gear, planning your meals, and then all the setup. Why do you like exploring our province camping instead of just staying in hotels? Well, you know, there's so much beauty in Manitoba. Like, it's... It doesn't matter which side of the province you're on, you find something different, right? You, it's you so have, diverse. Yeah, you have the Canadian Shield on the east side, and and then you get the valleys and the hills on the right, on the uh, west side. So it's such, a, and then up north, uh, you know, up head towards Flintlawn and the Paw and Thompson, there's some great campgrounds there too. Mm. And what is it about the experience of camping that makes it a great way to see Manitoba? I think it just simply gets you outdoors. I mean, you could stay in motels, hotels in the areas, but or even cabins, but I find that camping just, at least in what we camp in, it makes you uh, enjoy being outside and, and forces you to be outside. I, we love it. Mm hmm And then how, you guys have your own way of camping. Tell us about that. Like, where do you stay? <laughs> well, we try to boondock as much as possible when we camp um, with our little van. We have a little sprinter van, uh, leisure travel van, an older one. and. We have it set up with solar and lithium, so it allows us to park wherever we want. So, and that and that is the advantage for Manitoba camping. We can book those sites that don't have electricity or water hookup because all the amenities are in our unit. It gives us much more flexibility with finding those last-minute campsites. Yeah, mm, right, because you don't need the hookups. Yeah, That's exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. And another thing that might be daunting for people is reserving the campsites. Do you have any tips for people who are getting ready to book on the province's website? It's funny, you know, there's so many things, like we haven't even booked anything yet, but but we're not too concerned because we like to travel during the week. But if you are booking, you know, you try to get on as early as possible and hopefully hopefully you don't get kicked off. Last year it all seemed to work out quite well. I don't know what's happening this year yet. I think that people are having different experiences, but our tip is uh, be patient. Uh, have lots of backup choices. Don't think of just one campground. Think of several different backup choices. And we, we were talking about it just before, and we believe municipal campgrounds it should be another option, not just, you know, the typical ones on the province website. Mm, yeah, and there's yeah. A, a lot of smaller communities that have some great campgrounds. Awesome campgrounds, yeah. yeah. That's very true. So just before you go, you know, you've been sharing a lot of your camping adventures online. Where can people go to see your videos? So uh, our YouTube channel is called On the Off Wrap. And uh, we actually have a separate playlist of just Manitoba campgrounds as well. So that's, that features all the Manitoba campgrounds that we've been at. Okay, great. Well, we'll have to check that out and make our plans for the summer. Thanks, Lorraine and Wade. Have a great camping season. Thank great. You. Thanks for having Thank us. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Still ahead, Riley Laychuk is back with the seven-day forecast. You're watching CBC Winnipeg News.
Here's a look at your day planner for your Friday. We're looking at two degrees first thing in the morning. Tomorrow winds die off overnight to uh, northwest at 10 by the time we hit the morning. Plus eight by noon. Yes, we're looking at another uh, mainly sunny day tomorrow. Uh, less of a chance of scattered showers as we head through the day up to 14 degrees by the afternoon. 19 for Saturday. That is 10 degrees above our normal high of nine degrees at this time of the year. But uh, windy as we head through the weekend. Cloud starts to build in on Monday and then some showers hours moving as we get toward uh, the later part of next week into Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Right now, Wednesday, at least we're looking at about five to 10 millimeters of rain with some showers Tuesday and Thursday. Well, if you think you had a stellar view of the solar eclipse on Monday, take a close look at the up close perspective from these thrill seekers. Here's tonight's daily lift. Here's a video from above Cadeau Mills, Texas. Two couples chose to skydive in the total eclipse as it darkened the sky. Talk about the planets and stars aligning for a once in a lifetime sight. <laughs> I feel like I would enjoy that, except I'm scared of heights. But you know, the view I think might be worth it. It, it would be incredible, but yeah. I would be terrified. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> like The way they were screaming, I would be worse. Yeah. Imagine trying to do that with the solar glasses as well. Right. Yeah. Let's just pretend we <laughs> <Exactly>. did it. <laughs> Have a good night.